Hare Krishna, Gopal Hari Prabhu. Welcome to the Monks Podcast. I'm so happy. Thank you. So, it's my pleasure to be with you. You know, we have been together on the Shastrik Advisory Council, and even before that, uh, I I have heard about you. I think uh, after I heard about Radhika Raman Prabhu, then I came to know about you also. And one of the papers which I read of yours, which you sent me also recently. I think that was what we will discuss today, but I'll tell you from the angle which I'm coming and then you can tell me how you are coming to this, how you came to this. Okay. So when I was introduced to Krishna consciousness, like for everyone else, the problem of suffering, the problem of evil, as it is called in the West, that's a universal problem. And initially the explanation of karma seemed very reasonable for me, but mm. over the years, from being more of a, you could call a podium speaker to more of a human counselor or a human mm -hmm. mentor, I realized that karma is not really a adequate explanation. It is an important explanation, but in the past, I would just treat karma like a, like an all explanatory magic wand almost. Suffering is because of your own karma or our own karma. Yeah. But then I realized that it's especially when we are dealing with people at a one to one level and they are in distress, the, the idea of telling them that <clears throat> it's all your own karma, it's very insensitive, it's often quite unhelpful, it's unhelpful to them and it can alienate us from others. Mm. So I started looking at scripture and then I noticed that well, there is, we could say philosophy, where we discuss about where the principle of karma is implicit in the scripture. I don't think it is explicitly analyzed and described in any one section. It is implicit in various places, but it is practically never used to address people who are suffering directly. The person who is suffering may say, I must have done some karma because of which this is happening to me. But mm -hmm. others don't do that. So mm -hmm. whether we consider right. when Abhimanyu is killed at that time, what Krishna says to Arjuna, or whether we consider many other situations uh, in scripture, there is generally that is not used. That is not at least used as much as a standard explanatory tool as at other times. As, or I say, as we use ourselves. So then, uh, I also, when 9-11 had happened, I had read an article by Radhayan Maharaj in BTG. And he said, he says, first time I read that, that he says that you know, in times of such immense suffering, talks of karma, talking about karma makes no sense. So he says, what our wisdom offers us is that the soul is indestructible. And beyond, I'm paraphrasing his words now. Uh, so he says that beyond all the destructiveness of this world, the soul, soul stays eternal and hope springs eternal for those who know the soul. So something like that. It was a very, I felt a very sympathetic way of looking at things. Very yes. useful and compassionate way. And then I read your article, I think it was in the book Bhagwat, which I think Radhika Raman mm -hmm. Prabhu and Krishna Hitra Maja edited. Yes. Your title yes. itself was Bhagavatam's philosophy is theodicy beyond karma. Mm -hmm. So the way you analyze primarily, I think Bhishma's pastime uh, and the ex or Bhishma's discussion with Yudhishthir and how he analyzed the experience, that was very striking. So I mm -hmm. felt that what I had sensed through my experience, you mm -hmm. demonstrated through your analysis of that pastime. Mm -hmm. So I feel this is a very important subject, not only for satisfying our own for satisfying and strengthening ourselves when we are going through difficulties, but also for uh, helping others in a way that is compassionate and doesn't come off as either dismissive or judgmental. Mm. Yes. So you can tell me your thoughts on this as well as how you took up yes. this subject for your doctorate. So um, very uh, wonderful point that you're uh, uh, making here. And <clears throat> to begin with, there are many different problems of evil. So when we speak of the problem of evil, it's not one problem. There are different problems, and based upon that, there are different solutions. 
and like you're saying in different uh contexts and different um uh situations different solutions are more appropriate than others mm-hmm. so one of the problems of evil is the logical problem of evil so logically speaking why would an all powerful that is omnipotent all loving omnibenevolent and omniscient all knowing god why would he allow for suffering in this world mm. like this is <clears throat> the most fundamental problem of the, uh, of theology mm. there are many arguments for the existence of god at least five or six uh, rational arguments for the existence of god but this is one argument and really there's only one really good argument why someone can argue there is no god and that argument is the logical problem of evil that if god has the power to stop evil god has knowledge of all evil and god wants to stop evil then why does evil exist in response to the logical problem of evil as far as my own reading and experience karma is a very effective response without the idea of karma how do you explain a world of suffering um there are many there are various uh, solutions in uh, western literature like the free will defense uh posited by alvin plantinga um there is uh you know so many different theodicies of which the free will defense is the most popular uh, response but the free will defense while while uh it argues that suffering must exist to allow for free will it does not actually explain how free will works you know how it actually um uh, makes sense in the context of human suffering for example the suffering of a 6 month old child clearly it is not the free will of the child to suffer <clears throat> or to do wrong so why is that child suffering but when you take the free will defense and you apply it to many lifetimes <clears throat> that okay, is you apply it to reincarnation just and just karma just then uh then it works i just tell me better so when you say free will defense what you mean by that is people have free will and by that they may do something something bad and they will get the consequences and and that's why suffering comes up is that what you mean by free will defense yes um basically uh, you know aside the different that the free will defense means that in all loving all powerful all perfect god could allow for suffering in the world so that god can allow for free will in the world so because there is a greater good the free will defense is actually part of a greater good defense because god allows suffering even though it's bad he allows it because it is so valuable to have free will it's such a greater good to have free will that he's willing to pay the price of letting us suffer because if we did not have free will we certainly would not suffer we would be all good people this god is good and he created us as good people but then we would be like robots you know uh, we were just like you know machines and a robot can certainly certainly be the most ideal person but still he's a robot yeah. and so to allow for the greater good of free will god allows us to suffer <clears throat> no but still how does the allow, allowing free will lead to suffering or what is the relationship between the two that so, so it, yeah yes so uh, for example like a mother or father um may allow a child to go for surgery right they go for a painful surgery let's say some surgery needs to be done but the mother and father allow the child to go for surgery and experience that pain so that that child will um be able to walk and lead a normal life so the benefits of that suffering outweigh the pains mm-hmm. of the suffering in the same way if if we don't have the choice to do good or bad to love or not to love then mm-hmm. there wouldn't be any meaning to love in this world and god wants a world in which there is love unless i have unless i have the opportunity to betray my friend there's no meaning to friendship there's no meaning to loyalty because i have the choice to betray or to love therefore there's a meaning there's a you could say a significance and 
and love itself is meaningful because there's free will. I can, you know, purchase so many robots that will love me, but I still will never um, enjoy that relationship with okay. those robots as I will with a human being who has a choice not to love me. And therefore, the love is a greater good, which in which presupposes free will. It requires free will. That's a greater good, and therefore God allows it. Yeah. So now. I think you started by saying that there are different aspects, different, different problems of evil, also different access, aspects of the problem of evil. So I think what you are saying is, if we have, say, a group of people, say two people, let's put it A and B. So now yes. for A, even for A and B, or for A with God and B with God, to experience love, they have to have free will. And But yes. if in the course of free will, A might betray B or B might betray A. And that could lead to suffering. Yes. So... This can explain, this explains not so much that we are the cause of our suffering or as so much that suffering is inherent in the very existence of free will. And uh, is it like that? Of course, if you don't want to go into technicalities of this, this yes. is fine. Because no, this is a great discussion. So um, certainly good people are also free. Right? A perfectly good person who's a loving person who never does any major acts of evil is also free. Mm. So the need of love and free will does not mean that we actually have to perform evil. It doesn't mean that we are you know, um, uh, obliged to perform evil or evil you know, has to be experienced in order for us to experience love. At the same time, we we recognize them as good people. We appreciate their goodness because we see that evil is there in the world. At the same time, uh, the choice, uh, freedom means that that good person who may never do evil still has the real choice of doing wrong. And if it is a real choice, then what that means is at a certain point, someone will choose to do that wrong. It, it, it's... it's, uh, it's um, Asking and uh, it's expecting an unreasonable world where there's true choice, but no one will ever make the wrong choice. So let me explain it to you like this. Uh, God is omnipotent, right? God is all powerful, we say. So people say, if God is all powerful. Why is he pow not powerful enough to create a perfectly good world with free will? Yeah. yeah this no, is I why. I, yeah, yeah, I got this point. So I'm just, yes. uh, I'm, uh, see this, the standard Example, I also give that, you know, would any parent want to replace their children with robots? The robots would be perfectly obedient, but there would be the joy of parenting would all go from that. So that's a, that's a good example. That's a fair example. That the point of the free will defense, it's, if, I, if I can understand what you're saying is, so it's not necessary that A is the cause of their own suffering. Mm. If A suffers something, maybe it's mm. because... Uh, B, B misused their free will and that's why B betrayed A. Now A might have done something which caused B to betray, but it might not be proportional. So yes. in that sense, it's more in the, more we could say in the nature of the world itself that there is the possibility mm -hmm. of suffering rather than the responsibility of suffering being placed on the individual who is going through that suffering. Yes, I understand now your, your point. Yes, and, and, and that's the shortcoming of the free will. In Kunti Maharani's prayers also, when she talks about, in I think it is 1828, kali. So he says that, the, <clears throat> that it is because of illusions and misconceptions among people that the conflicts arise and distress comes from thereof. He says, you are equal to everyone and you are the Lord of everything. But you are impartial, but it is because of the interactions between people that distresses come up. So it, it, it might be something similar, although I don't think it's exactly the same. But uh, yeah, so you can respond to that. Yes, no, um, very nice point here. The, the shortcoming of the free will defense is that, that the nature of the world, like you're saying, because there's freedom and free will, it allows others to do bad. So... So B performs a bad act towards A. Um, I, I betray my friend because I exercise my free will. But 
what about the free will of my friend? The, my friend never wanted to be in that situation. They never seemed to do anything to be in that situation. So uh, if God has truly made a world with free agents, then why is he not respecting the freedom of the victim? Why only the freedom of the perpetrator, like you're saying? That's true, okay. And that's the shortcoming of the, of the free will defense that the idea of karma fills in. When you, mix, mm-hmm. when you add karma to the free will defense, where now all of a sudden, it's not just the free will of the perpetrator that God is respecting, but it's also the free will of the victim. Because the victim mm-hmm. in a past life acted in a certain way to in some sense choose their destiny. They chose their destiny to be betrayed by their friend because in this life or in a previous life, they betrayed someone else and mm-hmm. they needed to learn through that experience. Yeah. And so intellectually speaking, um, not the other problems of evil, which is the evidential problem of evil and phenomenological problem of evil, which we can get more into, but just in terms of satisfying the intellectual need to understand on a cosmic level, philosophically speaking, why God would allow evil. Without karma, there's no philosophical position that I have found that actually uh, gives a satisfying response that's wholesome. You know, free will definitely moves in that direction. But, mm. but what about my choice? Why am I suffering? That only a, a, a karma can make sense of. Okay. So, yeah, I think uh, we, it could be put another way. I, I would like to go into this classification of, of the other aspects, phenomenological and evidential aspects. But okay, I can say that my position, if we say that I didn't think about it specifically in terms of the logical problem of evil, but we could say karma is, as you said, it is the most plausible explanation. Uh, or we could say another way of putting it is that it is the least implausible explanation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So ultimately, yes. there is, it's, it's a very difficult problem to address. And uh, yeah, can you explain the other aspects of the other evidential aspect and the phenomenological? Yes. Um, and just one quick thing before uh, that point, in terms of karma, the, the, there, are, um, there are challenges or you could say difficulties as far as the logical problem of evil as well in the idea of karma as well. And one of those, for example, is, well, the cycle of karma is a cycle of action and reaction. But in the beginning, why did God set it up this way? And in the beginning, if God created us equal, why is it that some people choose to do the wrong thing and others do the right thing? So, mm-hmm. so fine, karma is the rules of the game. But, but why is it that some of us were created by God to choose in a more uh, informed way than others? in a better way than others. Mm. And to respond to this, the Vedanta Sutra actually has a very interesting conversation where the objector objects against the Vedanta Sutra, this very point. And in response, the Vedantin, uh, the, the conclusion that the Vedantin gives is that in fact, we as individuals, the cycle of karma and the world and God are all beginningless. Meaning that we've always existed, uh, our choices are truly our choices. And we have, um, what God creates us in the sense that God sustains us, but God does not create our choices. God may facilitate them. God may, uh, you know, uh, keep us into existence, but it is truly mm-hmm. our choices mm-hmm. from beginningless time that determine our future. And so this is just an example. Problems like that. Also, another problem is why we don't remember our, Just one minute. Our, uh, Let me this problem. Yeah, so does beginninglessness really solve the problem or does it like take the problem to where, where you don't need an explanation? So in the sense that, uh, say when the Big Bang Theory was proposed in, I'm taking a cosmological equivalent. Yes. When the Big Bang Theory was proposed, Initially, many atheistic scientists and thinkers opposed it vehemently because they were more in favor of the steady state theory. 
because if the universe has a beginning then it requires a beginner then yes. if it is the universe has always existed as, as it is then it's much easier to deny the need or the existence of a organizer or a beginner at all and i think much of buddhist philosophy is like that the cosmos itself is at one level eternal our entanglement is not but the cosmos is yes. so eventually when the in at least the mainstream scientific community accepted the big bang theory and supportive evidence for that then i think stephen hawking was around the first who proposed that it's not just linear it's cyclic mm. that means he said that there's a big bang and there's a big crunch and big bang and a big crunch and of course there are others who talk about space time as circular more than linear now these are complex concepts and i'm really simplifying them here but the point is that if existence is cyclic then there is no need for it to have any beginning or any beginner also but you know so a so existence may be cyclic it's like a circle is right a cir- circle is goes round and round that's yeah. fine so after the circle is made we can't trace where did it begin mm. but still even the circle needs to have a beginning at some time yes so in that sense just saying that things are beginningless does that really address the problem so that would mean that god is uh, has permanently placed some souls in this cycle and maybe there are some souls who are never placed in this cycle mm-hmm. so then it doesn't really does it really address that problem uh, it doesn't so uh, the the idea of beginninglessness does not answer the problem of evil it simply answers questions regarding beginnings karma is the response to the problem of evil we are suffering in this world because god has given us free will free choice mm. and then we have to experience the results of those free decisions but then people say well but the, how did it start you know why in the beginning did god give us this well it's answering that question of beginnings there is no beginning we 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 are who god and us are are eternal beings like krishna says in the bhagavad gita mm-hmm. no beginning and no end nat vivaham jatanasam nat nat tam eva in jam nat vivaham jatanasam tum name so this is uh, and that the name janadipa so never did i exist in the past nor will i ex- never was a time when i did not exist in the past nor will i not exist in the future uh, the soul has no beginning it has no end so therefore um therefore the point is that uh, that's the nature of the self and it's bringing responsibility on the self rather than on god for beginless time we've had our own choices and we cannot say that god put this choice in me or god made me this way now someone may say that well why does god not change it okay this is who i was but why doesn't he not now make me into a better person and that's but then the response is that's exactly what god is doing yes through the process of karma through the experiences of this world he's allowing us out of our own free will and experiences to change ourselves for the better yeah and so therefore god is doing his part of, of when we when we go in the wrong direction uh, to to bring us back in the right direction mm. so the idea i think in vedanta also it is overall there that there is another level of reality beyond this so when we talk about it uh, about karma being beginningless that means it's more a talk of that we can go from this reality to that reality it doesn't really address how we came in this reality in the first place mm. it just says that this is this is where we are and this is where we have been mm. so is now it- this is the other very important point that if we say that we have been suffering in this world since beginningless time then in some ways we are saying that we've been suffering for eternity uh if we go to the mathematical concept of infinity right infinity has no end hmm. in the same way minus infinity has no end so if we've been in suffering in this world since minus infinity we've been suffering in this world eternally and if we're suffering in the world eternally that means our suffering also has no end logically speaking our suffering will never come to an end oh okay so, so therefore while we are beginningless so you're saying that if it goes backward forever 
then it will go forward also forever exactly and if it's yes forward if it's going to end then in the backward also should be ending then backward also okay yes yes and so therefore uh, it is um uh, while we are beginningless based upon the different acharyas that that i've come across and that you know others have also studied it appears that and there's a big discussion on this point but it appears that the general conclusion of the acharyas is that our our ex, our stay in this world our experience in this world has a beginning because if our stay in this world is beginningless then it's also endless but mm-hmm. because it has a beginning therefore it has an end like in the gita there are, there are two um there are two ontological categories of reality and only two one is sat which is eternal and mm-hmm. the other is asat which is temporary okay. and krishna says those things that have a beginning must have an end and that which is beginningless is also endless so we have to choose if if suffering's endless it's also beginningless if we're going to use the ontological framework of of the vedas if if something has a beginning therefore it must have an end and because this world and the sufferings in this world are asat they must have a beginning and an end it's interesting and therefore you know, we have free will sorry when you talk about two categories i thought of them as matter and spirit two categ but you're talking about sat and asat so then are we considering suffering as an ontological reality apart from the psychological experience of suffering so suffering as a tangible reality because if you what is that 1321 i think karya karana kartrutve hetu prakrutu chute purusha sukha dukhana bhoktrutve hetu ruchute so krishna says that the you know, cause and effect is cause within the domain of material nature but pleasure and pain are experienced because of the soul's desire to to enjoy this world mm. so yes so suffering itself but the way you are analyzing it is either we have to place suffering in the domain of asat or sat so we are considering mm. suffering also to be a thing here so is it something that yes. is from matter and spirit yes so um see everything uh, uh, like in in vaishnav theology any experience that we have is a substance in other words the only way we can actually experience it is if it is real uh ramanujacharya said even mirages like things that appear to be unreal like you know the, the you know water seen on fire or water seen in the desert it is still real there's some there's some minuscule amount of water there okay. therefore we feel that water is there yeah. so suffering is experience it's true it's an experience but it is also something that exists therefore we experience it and um uh, the, the point the important point here is that that free will is beginningless we've always had free choice and therefore we've always been loving uh, uh, intentional human beings but our wrong choice and the beginning of suffering that is not beginningless that has a beginning so so we imagine a situation we've been in the spiritual world we're enjoying with god we're good people we're loving god and at a certain point we have the desire we choose to turn away from god we choose to be envious we choose to be greedy we choose to be angry at that point that our experience in the material world starts and that has a beginning okay yeah i think uh, there is a lot of animated discussion on this topic of how a soul might turn away from god and when it, whether it exactly happens or not and that could be a separate discussion itself yes but maybe uh, let's focus on what we are discussing right now so i like the way you put this that <clears throat> everything that we experience has to have some basis in reality so what we experience may not exactly coincide with the reality of what what thing is but mm. it there has to be some co- some yes. some connection so if there is nothing at all like we say there is uh if there were we have to have some experience of a snake to mistake a rope to be a snake so there has to be yes. yeah there has to be some reality which we may experience in a distorted way also i think the example of uh, reflection the 15 chapter upside down tree mm. something that is 
ontologically unreal can never be an object of experience. That's a strong claim. Okay, so when now, uh, when people have fiction, say movies which are science fiction or simply fiction, so there is some connection with reality. The characters mm -hmm. have either emotions similar to humans, the characters mm -hmm. may have some bodily forms and abilities separate from us. So unless there is something similar, Yes. There can be something. There has to be something similar, and there may be a significant thing which is dissimilar, or we could say that is not real. But unless there is some grounding in reality, it is not possible to experience that. Well, the movie itself and the dream itself is also real, so it has semblance to our day-to-day -day experience. So therefore, we create it, we imagine it, and we we produce it. But then the experience itself, although it may not match our day-to-day -day reality, but the, but the movie itself, the screen, the characters, the cartoons, those are also real. Okay. And if they're not real, I can't experience that. Yeah, that's true. You know, when I read the Govinda Bhashya, Baldevin Devotions, uh, there's a very striking section where he talks about dreams. And he says, uh, are dreams real? So normally we often say this world is like a dream. And he said, use it in the sense that, okay, this world, sometimes it is, this world is false. Yes. But he turns that argument around and he says that actually this world is like a dream. I'm paraphrasing again. And because this world is real, therefore dreams are also real. And that's why we can experience uh, sometimes ultimate reality in dreams. Krishna may come in the dreams. The spiritual master may come in the dreams. So yes. it's not that everything in the dream is real. Nor is everything in the dream unreal. The dream has to have some basis in reality. So in some ways, uh, the task of intelligence is actually to separate the real from the unreal in our lived experience, whether it is conscious. Whether, of course, we don't analyze dreams so much. But in some ways, the process of bhakti is also we utilize this world, like the hamsa, uh, yes. take the milk and reject the water. So yes. this one, so it's more of separating the real from the unreal. Mm. Okay. Yes. And I, I wouldn't even go so far as to say that there's something that is unreal. Sometimes the word is used, the word is used, uh, the, uh, the word unreal is used to denote a lesser reality. So it's unreal in relation to things that are eternal. Temporary things are unreal in the sense that they're temporary and not eternal. But really, in the case of a dream, it's a mistaken perception. It's completely real. That's why I'm sleeping in my bed and I'm screaming and shouting. If it was not real, why would I scream and shout? It is completely real, but it is a mistaken identity. I am thinking I am the person in my dream who is chasing me when in fact I am not. That is actually that person there is a figment of my mind. It's been created by my mind. It is real. It's been created by my mind, but it's not me. That's the mistake mm -hmm. that I made. So it is a lesser reality or it is a mistaken perception, but it's not truly unreal. And we see the Bhagavatam and Vedic texts in general, um, they speak unreality more as a way of talking, a way of saying but they don't mean unreality in the, in the strict ontological sense that it actually does not exist. That's that a, is a no. Yeah, that's a very important point. And I think this is quite a misconception about Hindu thought in general. You know, I read a book on the, basically the problem of evil uh, that was written after the tsunami. And there were different perspectives given by different religions. And I found the Hindu perspective, I looking forward to how they would present it. Also, very, you could say, annoyingly simplistic. This is the Hindus say, ultimately the world is a dream. So our pleasure and pain, it's all a dream. And then you wake up, you'll realize there is no pleasure, no pain. I don't, I don't see that as a fair representation of what, what Hindu thought or Vedic thought or whatever name we use. Maybe yes. that's not a fair, that's not at all a fair representation. Isn't it? This is actually one of the reasons I, I was working on this. This is one question you'd ask me, you know, why did I start working on this theme, on this topic? Because I found so many responses in the academic literature 
which said that in Hinduism, the way they respond to evil is to say that it doesn't exist. It's unreal. It's all illusion. It's Maya. Um, the world really doesn't exist. Evil doesn't exist. And, you know, to some degree, that may be true if we look at certain philosophers in Hinduism, certain traditions. But how is that helpful? How does that help anyone? The fact is we are living in this world. People are suffering. You know, children, adults, old people, there is dealing with real issues. And first of all, it's not factually correct. And second of all, it's very unhelpful to say that evil just doesn't exist or we don't exist or the world is a dream. So what if the world is a dream? The fact is that we're in this world. It's as real as anything to us. And we want to find a solution to our sufferings, to our difficulties. We also want to know why am I in the dream? It might be a dream, but just describing it doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't explain the situation. Yeah. So yes, we're in a dream, but still God is to blame. Why did he put us in this bad dream? Fine, it's not real, but why did he make us feel that it is real? Those, mm -hmm. So Hinduism still faces the same problems as other traditions do in terms of the problem of evil. Yeah, that's true. And uh, what you said exactly that even if I understand it's a dream, now from a dream, somebody can just throw some water on my face and wake me up. But I can't be woken up from that dream like that. There is a systematic, sustained, often prolonged process required for waking up. And during that process, still I have to, I have to, I have to deal with the problems of life. And then I think if further also another problem remains is if it's all a dream, then why do some people have worse dreams than others? Isn't it? So, yes. so that also, the, the difference in sufferings of different people also remains a problem that is unanswered by that. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So going back to this point about eternal, now I've seen that some Christians, they define eternal only as forward. Because their idea is that when a man and a woman unite, that's when a new soul is created. Because yes. they, they don't accept the idea of pre-existence. So, mm -hmm. so then I thought it was just a, just a, a stray Christian idea or a fringe Christian idea. But I have seen many mainstream dictionaries also define the word eternal as, as forever from now. Not just mm -hmm. no beginning and no end, but just mm -hmm. no end. Just no end. Mm -hmm that way. Yes. So it's almost like if you say it's infinity, it's half infinity from here onward. Yes. So is that a, is it like, a, first of all, is it mainstream Christian thought? And is it really logically sound to mm. argue eternity in that way? Mm. So uh, there's actually a theologian, Thomas Aquinas, uh, a yeah. very famous uh, theologian, uh, the main saint for the Catholic tradition, uh, the largest tradition of Christianity. And if we read his writings, actually, Thomas Aquinas deals with this issue. And he says that, you know, rationally speaking, uh, if God is beginningless, it's somewhat um, not illogical, but somewhat difficult to say that at a certain point, God decided to create us. Right? If God is beginningless, then why? How can you, and God is beyond time. That's the key point. God is beyond time. Then how can you say at a certain point in time, God created us? So he recognizes that it may be the case. And he actually says this openly. It may be the case that we are also beginningless. All souls are eternal. God is eternal and all souls are eternal. Okay. And he recognizes that philosophical issue, which, you're rec uh, which you are pointing out, that of course, for God, everything is possible. So we cannot say that God could not have created us at a certain point and eternity means from now onwards. But he says it's also likely that we've always existed. And still in that case, he says, God would be called creator. How? In the very same Vedantic way that Vedantins say, uh, God is creator in the sense that he continuously creates us. And there's actually a phrase in Christianity for this. It's called continuous creation. God continuously creates us. That is, he keeps us into existence. Without his keeping us into existence, we could not live. And in that way, he's our creator. Okay. You know, sometimes these kind of discussions, it is uh, often explanations raise more questions than they answer. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, we could go explore this particular time line line of thought, but I think we wanted to focus on the problem of evil. Yes. So would you like to discuss? Uh, how the Bhagavatam addresses the problem of evil or would you like to go into the yes. other aspects of evidential phenomenological, whichever direction you would like to take it? So that's where the Shriman Bhagavatam comes in actually. So we've seen, you know, the basic general response to the logical problem of evil, but then there's the evidential problem, which says that, okay, logically evil should exist in this world, but why so much evil? Why did God have to put us through so much you know, why not less? And, and why does it, it come in the way that it comes? And this is not something that a person can answer so easy. And therefore, I do agree, coming back to your original point, that karma is not a fully satisfying response to the problem of evil. It may satisfy the intellect or just the, you know, the tough questions, but it doesn't answer the main problem, which is the degree and the severity of the experience of, our, of evil. And so therefore, the Bhagavatam is saying we have to go one step further. And in order to explain the amount of suffering in this world, we have to understand that there's a, that there's a higher divine plan. There's, there's the plan of God, which is, there, which is there to help us. It's meant to help us. Mm-hmm. And that, that goes beyond just our own choices and what's, you know, what's fair and, and suffering for or the things that we did right or wrong. That goes at a level of love, where God is making us go through certain experiences, even if we don't deserve them, because God feels that this will help us. And so the Srimad Bhagavatam begins by first rejecting the problem of evil as a complete response to the, uh, I'm sorry, rejecting karma as a complete response to the problem of evil, especially in terms of the suffering of the righteous, okay. in terms of the suffering of the good people. Where does it categorically reject that? Is there any particular um, verse which says it rejects it? Because rejecting is a strong word. Yes, it is a strong word. Um, in the discussion of Bhishma and the Pandavas, Bhishma says, so I, like I said, not, it never rejects it as a general response, but Bhishma um, says that ha- how karma could not be the reason why the Pandavas were suffering. He alludes to this, uh, I, I, and you're absolutely right. He doesn't openly reject it, but he but he makes it very clear that um, that the Pandavas could not be suffering due to their past karma because he points out that Yudhishthira is dharma personified. If someone is dharma personified, then they could not be suffering due to their past karma. Oh, okay. So it's implicit. Yeah. So then that's, I think that's the very second verse, second or third verse it is in his, that Yatta Dharma Suto Raja. So he's talking about the Gadapanir. He's talking about how from the point of view of virtue, from the point of view of ability, and from the point of view of devotion, in terms of ability, they had Arjuna and Bhima with them. From the point of, they also had, a, they had a Supreme Lord also over there, Surut Satam. Yes. So, Okay, so it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not an adequate explanation. I think that's a fair enough point. And also, we see that in the discussion between the bull and uh, Parikshit Maharaj also. Yes. Parikshit Maharaj offers that explanation or offers that as one option. And the bull doesn't accept that. The bull says the cause of suffering is very difficult to ascertain. Yes. Yeah, you can go ahead. So the, the evidential problem of evil is... Um, uh, is answered by, by the fact that at a certain point when we're dealing with the problem of evil, we need, to, we need to recognize our fallibility in God's infallibility. We have to recognize that we don't understand the, the larger picture. We can't see the cosmic picture. And that's where faith comes in, that, that for the religious practitioner, for the believer, there has to be something that is not fully explicable that we are willing to accept if we have faith in someone or something that is higher. And there Prabhishma, he ends his sort of discourse by saying that we know as, as the uh, practitioner, the bhakta, that 
that we know that the plan of God is perfect and is perfect in all respects, but we cannot know that plan. So he tells you Hishra that accept the plan, but the plan is not subject to infinity. Some things we may know, some things God may reveal, but some things God may not reveal. And we have to uh, take that in our stride. So in terms of counseling people, like you were mentioning, uh, everyone feels that they're a good person because they are. So in some sense, every person is a righteous person. And therefore, Bhishma's instructions are very relevant in terms of counseling, given that most likely the people that we're counseling are not, you know, Stalins and Hitlers and, you know, criminals, but are gen generally good people. They need to understand that their suffering may not be due to their past karma, but it's actually due to a higher reason, a, a way that we can grow and develop. God teaching us a very deep um, lesson in love. And therefore, that, that lesson in love will make us into a better person. Okay. So this uh, seems quite similar to the story of Job in the Old Testament. Yes. So basically, God, this Job is suffering enormously. And when he asks, why am I suffering? And then God basically comes, did you know where you were when I created the stars and the universe? So basically, he talks about how insignificant Job is compared to God's omniscience. And uh, I think that is one of the, we could say one of the, in the biblical texts themselves, that is one of the main places where the problem is at all attempted to be addressed. Mm. So yes. in some ways, the Avanti Brahman pastime is somewhat similar. But there he's talking more in terms of <clears throat> it's the mind, mm -hmm. mind's perception that is causing the, causing the suffering. But mm -hmm. so if, if you compare that, that there is, a, there is a plan of the Lord. So then that means something, it, it does not necessarily mean that God is causing the suffering. Mm -hmm. So I sometimes differentiate between the terms cause and purpose. Mm. You know that that cause there can be many causes for a particular thing to happen, but mm. cause is where something comes from, purpose is where something takes us. Mm -hmm. So yes. <clears throat> so in that sense, the causes can be many and we may not even know precisely what the cause is. So it, it's actually to consider God to be the cause of our suffering. Mm. And God to uh, that ultimately there's a purpose for our suffering, as you said, to grow and to evolve, to ultimately attain, attain God, attain eternal life with him. So I think that yes. does our philosophy actually specifically say that God is the cause of our suffering or mm. when you say it's a plan, it is, the, mm. I was just looking at the Sanskrit and remember, yes. so this mm. is Daiva Tantram. So, yes. so any thoughts on this? Yes. Um, uh, the, uh, in some sense, even in the, in the suffering of the righteous, even in the, in righteous, God is not the cause because, uh, the metaphor that the Bhagavatam gives is that, um, suffering for the righteous is like, uh, melting gold. And when you melt gold, it becomes all the more brilliant, right? It starts to shine. Well, that righteous person needs a certain experience. So in that sense, they are the cause. They need the experience. Therefore, God is arranging a situation where they can go through that experience. So, so there are many causes. And therefore, um, there's, the, you know, there's the final cause. There is the you know, efficient cause. There's the material cause. So God is the efficient cause, not the final cause. God is, is, in that sense, is making the situation where he's allowing people to, to uh, his great devotees, kind-hearted souls, to go through very dramatic experiences. Like the Pandavas, they lost all of their children. They saw Abhimanyu die. Such a difficult experience. Krishna's allowing that experience. And in that way, he's the efficient cause. He is a cause. And we cannot deny that he's not a cause, but he's not the only cause. 
the final cause uh, may be an experience that the devotee needs to go through. Uh, it may be uh, for the benefit of all of us that Krishna wants to glorify his devotee so that we can learn something. Mm. Right? So yes. you're absolutely right. That Krishna ultimately is never the final cause or, or he could be. I mean, God is free to do anything. But generally speaking, uh, Krishna is the efficient cause of our distress. Okay. But, but we are the final cause. Our, our need to learn is the final cause, the main reason. You know, when you put it this way, I was thinking of something, an example came to my mind about, again, the evidential problem of evil. Say, if somebody is sick, mm -hmm. and sometimes the treatment for that sickness is itself painful. Mm -hmm. And some sick, if we just take from the perspective of this lifetime, that sometimes some people may have got into some indulgences mm. and those indulgences cause them suffering. Mm -hmm. Say somebody smokes and then they get uh, lung cancer or something like that. Mm. So now or somebody drinks and they get uh, liver problems. Now we cannot really correlate on, a, on any mathematical scale how much they indulge and how much they are suffering. Mm. Mm. But we, and sometimes uh, maybe if, if it's something, something cancer, the treatment itself is painful, chemotherapy or radiotherapy. But yes. the point is that now you have this, if you go through the treatment, you'll be cured. So the suffering that is there, uh, rather than at one level, we want to address the cause of suffering so that we don't do anything to repeat it. Mm. So in that, at that level, we want to understand it. But it's yes. not so much, uh, it's not so much a precise correlation in uh, quantity. Now, how much somebody indulge, it could be that somebody smokes a lot and they don't get cancer or their cancer is detected very early and they're saved. Somebody smokes a little, but their cancer gets detected very late and they suffer terribly. Mm -hmm. But the important thing is, okay, there is a cure available and even if the cure is less painful or main pain, more painful for you, if you go through the cure, you will be, mm. go to the treatment rather, you will be yes. healed. So we could say that the more important than the, the, the treatment, the, the treatment is the plan of the Lord. Mm. Specifically why you got the disease, right. could be very different, many different causes for that. Uh, very, very wonderful point. That, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the treatment is the plan of the Lord. And therefore, um, this, the, so first of all, the Bhagavatam then response to the evidential problem is in some ways a greater good response. Okay. Uh, that, that suffering is in this world, and this can also be used in counseling in terms of the experience of suffering that people have, that whatever it might be, the suffering in this world is not exactly because we did something wrong. It could be for that reason, but that's not the only reason. It's not exactly because we are, uh, we are responsible, but it is there for a greater good. Be it karma, be it not karma, it's there for the greater good so that we can learn something from this. Mm. Now, the only way that a greater good um, theodicy is, um, logic, uh, is, is uh, conceivable or um, is coherent is if suffering has an end. If it's endless, then there can't be any greater good for it, right? So one thing that I argue is that the Bhagavatam's ultimate response is that suffering has a beginning and an end. That's very important because if it's endless, it, there's no greater good. You're just going to suffer and suffer and suffer and suffer. It, it, there's, there's, just, there's just no greater good you can get from it. And that's Christian theodicies um, have a lot of difficulty with this. If, you're an idea, if you have an idea of eternal damnation, then how could... God be all loving. A very important point. Either God's love can be unlimited or hell can be unlimited. But both of them cannot be unlimited. If God's love is unlimited, hell has to be limited. It has to end at a certain point. If hell is unlimited, then God's love is limited. Now, most religious traditions believe in an unlimitedly loving God. So if God is unlimited, our stay in this world for every living being has to be limited. 
And many Christian theologians recognize that. And uh, it's, it's called a global theodicy of fulfillment. And they say that, you know, that ultimately each person, each soul will reach God. And I, I believe that is, that is our theo theology as well. Hmm. This, uh, this all souls will reach God. That is, that is not the mainstream Christian theology, but I think it is gaining some traction in today's world. Quite a number of influential theologians are talking about it. Isn't it? Wrong? Yes. Uh, yeah. I, the, the newer theodicies, uh, there's the Iranian theodicy, uh, the global theodicy of fulfillment. Uh, these, these, are, these are some very uh, kind of new and emerging theodicies that are quite popular. Um, uh, at Oxford University, when I was doing my PhD, uh, the professor of divinity, Marilyn Adams, I think uh, I'm forgetting her name, but I think it's Mar Marilyn Adams. She wrote many books on the problem of evil. One of the titles of her books is Horrendous Evil. And this is one thing that she argues, that as a Christian, she was also a practicing Christian. She was also the professor of divinity. She was making a strong argument that as a Christian, the only way to reconcile evil and the, and the existence of God in this world is if we um, are, believe that eventually every person gets salvation. She rejected the idea of eternal, eternal damnation. And she said that mm -hmm. you, can, you, can, you can stomach evil. You can accept it if every person ultimately gets salvation. And that's the only way to make sense of it. Because another important point that it brings in is the perfection of God. Mm -hmm. So if there's even one person in this world who cannot get salvation, that means that's an imperfect creation. And if it's an imperfect creation, that means that's an imperfect creator. Mm -hmm. Because something that God created is imperfect. Therefore, God is imperfect. God may allow us to suffer temporarily as a way to, you know, to improve us. But if we have no means of improvement, that means that fundamentally there's something that is imperfect in God's creation. So how could a perfect person create an imperfect world? Mm, that's make, that makes a lot of sense. One thing struck me is that there seems to be a lot of serious uh, intellectual engagement with the problem of evil in the Western world as compared to within the Dharmic traditions as of now in the yes. contemporary times. It's Yes, in past times and also contemporary times. That was one of the biggest challenges I had while I was working on the problem of evil is that our shastras and texts, they don't deal with it directly. As you were mentioning, you know, where is it said? Where is it? There's no extended you know, discussions on the problem of evil philosophically, theologically, how to understand it. They teach through stories, they teach through teachings, but it was something that was almost taken for granted. That's, that's been my observation, that suffering is there. And because of the idea of many lifetimes, and also the idea that you know, we all get moksha at a certain point throughout, through our learning, that you know, it's, it's, we need to learn. And and therefore, it was taken, it was almost like assumed. The answer was all automatically assumed. And therefore, we don't have the, you know, we don't have the uh, extensive discussions of this topic in Vedic literature, historically speaking, and, and up to, you know, you know, you could say the Western engagement of the Vedas with the West. But in the Western world, you have very extensive discussions on evil. And I think part of it is because uh, the idea of reincarnation of many lives was not so prominent. And therefore that raises, you know, very big questions. You know, if a person just lives for 15 years, what was the purpose of their life? How did they lead a fulfilling life? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's definitely been a bigger question in the West than in the East. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think reincarnation and karma brought together, brought together, uh, make things, not that blatantly unjust or incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. it's still, it's there. You know, regarding not see, not like deep metaphysical discussion. There is greater discussion on the nature of reality, on the means to attain liberation. Yeah. It's not so much. It's almost assumed that this world is a place of distress, mm -hmm. and that. We have to 
we have to elevate and liberate ourselves from the world and how to do that is more important than analyzing the comparative levels of distress of different people mm. and trying to yes. address that mm. absolutely yes. yes to take another example imagine if someone said uh, your life is a trillion years you're going to live for 1 trillion years and in that period for 50 years there's going to be a lot of suffering well that that suffering of 50 years is still not excusable you should not suffer but still in the context of a trillion years 50 years is like okay okay but after that i'll be happy now if someone says that your life is 60 years but of that 50 years i have to suffer then all of a sudden that suffering is very serious you know i have 60 years one life and of that 50 years i suffered how could god allow this so just uh, in terms of an uh, uh, you could say an experiential point or just a you know common sense point um, in terms of philosophers at that time it wasn't such an urgent point like you like you mentioned yeah. therefore we find select discussions in the vedanta sutra and other places but it's not such an urgent point the nature of reality is more important the the bigger evil the bigger problem is i don't want to be in the cycle of birth and death how do i get out of the cycle of birth and death yes you know in the 13 138 to 12 in the bhagavad gita where janma mrityu jara vyadi dukha dosha darshanam so prabhupad in the translation i think he uses the word the universal evils of birth old age disease and death so uh-huh. that we zero rather than why do some people die earlier or why do people get more diseased the very presence of death and disease are evil not the time when they appear or the severity with which they appear the, the, the their very existence is, is evil is we could say an evil that needs explanation that needs a yes so, it needs yeah go ahead yeah it needs explanation and it needs a solution and that's why um they were always more concerned about how to get out of it than how we got into it and uh, and and the details of that cycle yes. yeah and uh, also the the idea that the world is a place of distress at one level even in the old testament there are statement like this this world is a veil of tears but it doesn't seem to be that prominent a teaching over there or is it that that emphasis was lost because of say the renaissance scientific revolution and the progress because i remember several i read books by several by shri prabhupada disciples as well as other westerners who have sought you know, wisdom from the east mm. they said that one of their first things is why do eastern philosophers say the world is a place of distress that that is something which is new it's so directly in the face so is that such a prominent teaching in christian theology of course there are many different christian theologies um actually uh currently i'm teaching a course on god suffering and evil so i teach at the university of evansville and here uh, out of the three courses i'm teaching this semester one of them is specifically on the topic god suffering and evil and so we look at this problem in different world religions and uh this semester being the coronavirus i'm teaching online so i'm teaching from home and uh i am finding videos for them because i don't like to record my videos and put them online it's like i feel very odd so i'm trying to find videos for them that are already you know recorded and posting it for the students and so i was going through youtube looking at different a uh, christian responses to the problem of evil and one thing that i observe is exactly the point that you're making uh, 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 kind of related or relevant to the point that you're making is that so many of the responses they actually point out that look according to the christian bible and the christian faith this world is not supposed to be a world of happiness and and, and so christian theologians themselves are 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 many of them are saying look we came in this world because of you know uh, because of sin uh we're in a state of sin so how can you expect heaven in a place where there's sin this is not heaven this is 
This is the earth. We are aspiring to go to heaven. And therefore, the fact that God has put suffering in this world is, is very much like the reason why a prison will have suffering. Well, obviously, there's pain there. There's, uh, there's, it, that's why it's called a prison house. So I would say that a lot of Christian theologians do accept the fact that this world is not meant to be heaven. It, it's, it's not the heavens. At the same time, um, at the same time, there's also the concept, and this is where I think the, the positive side comes in, is that when Jesus Christ appeared in this world, he was God in human form, God actually coming in mm-hmm. matter. He actually took the form of matter. And so therefore, he elevated matter to a higher level. In other words, he made matter divine. Mm-hmm. And, and so therefore, the material is still divine. And I would actually say in Judaism, there's more of a concept that this world is not really a place of suffering. Right now there is suffering, but in Judaism, they believe that we're still waiting for the Messiah to come. And when the Messiah comes, the world itself will become paradise, will become paradise. So in Christianity, this is not paradise. Heaven is a separate place. Um, And so they do see it as a place of suffering mostly, but in Judaism, which is very closely to Christianity, it's kind of like the you know the forefather, or you could say uh, you know, older than Christianity. There is definitely this idea that paradise is on earth, and the Christian traditions inherited that idea to some degree. Oh, okay. So then, heaven can become earth, or yeah. earth can become heaven. So then it it might also be because of uh, the overall Protestant work ethos on which America was founded where there is the idea that you can have the, the great American dream that you can be pious, you can be religious and you can have a good life. And now there's of course the growth from that prosper, prosperity gospel, which is often panned by even mainstream Christians. So the idea that by worshiping God, we can have a happy life in this world. We could say that it is uh, okay. You could say that you, by worshiping God, you might be happier than what you would be otherwise. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you will be happy. Yes. It's like say somebody is sick and you're taking treatment. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be free from all pain. Mm. But when you're taking treatment, it's likely that you may be in less pain. Although sometimes the treatment itself may also cause pain. So Mm -hmm. in the sense, there is no, there is no one-to-one correlation between one's righteousness and one's state of happiness or distress in the world. Mm. Yes. Uh, And uh, I would just add to that, I completely agree with this point. And I would just add to that, that, that the, um, yeah, the, a person who is righteous, like Jesus Christ said, will find that their path is laden with thorns that a person who is on the righteous path may actually find more difficulties than a person who's, who's not on the righteous path. Uh, another theme in the Bhagavatam as well, because that person is now training. You know, that person is going through all the exercises which are so painful and difficult to become that brilliant diamond or that gold to sharpen himself. So I, I fully uh, appreciate that point And I, 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 I agree with it that, um, being happy, you know, you know, being happier doesn't mean realizing ultimate happiness or being in a state of happy happiness. Uh, in fact, you could be happier, but still experiencing more pain in some ways, more, more suffering in this world. But you're still happier because you see the goal at the end. You see the light at the end of the tunnel. You see, ah, you know, at the end of this, I'm going to, you know, be so, you know, I'm going to realize my true happiness and therefore all of this is worth it. And you feel happy to go through that pain. Okay. So now this in, this is maybe I I would like to take this in a slightly different direction. We can come back Mm. to our direction, uh, our main discussion later. See in the West mindfulness has become quite common and uh, mindfulness is often associated with Buddhism, but much of mindfulness doesn't really address the problem of evil. It is not so much 
philosophical as it is pragmatic and there it does say that you know, if you can just shift your consciousness uh, to various things to the values that you want to live by to the purposes that you want to achieve so shift your consciousness elsewhere and the magnitude of suffering will decrease so in that sense uh, what what you said is that by staying focused on a purpose then the the present experience of suffering will become a bit more bearable it's like somebody is sick and they know they are being treated they are in expert hands are being treated well then although they are in pain right now the thought of a future recovery makes their pain bearable mm -hmm. but if there is no hope for recovery there is just an uh, unclear prognosis then it becomes then the pain of the present at the physical level becomes multiplied by the hopelessness at the mental level mm. yes the the middle way is very interesting because it's the path of moderation mm. and what buddha was teaching is that if your if your desires are very strong and your ambitions are very big materially speaking then that's going to cause a lot of suffering and when people have also very great aspirations and they're are very greedy lusty for material things they also cause others a lot of suffering and pain so by following the middle path we're following the path of moderation and following the path of moderation allows us to focus on the things that are actually important in life which is uh, solving the problem of birth and death you know freeing ourselves from the bonds of ignorance so this middle way middle path is 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 completely in line with the teaching of the gita where krishna is saying the yogi who eats too much or eats too little sleeps too much or sleeps too little cannot attain perfection this is exactly the teaching of the gita krishna is saying we have to follow the middle path because if we go on extremes then our whole focus will be on our body if we're fasting too much we'll think of our body all the time if we're eating too much we'll also think of our body too too much so krishna is saying make the material things which bring us suffering make them minimize them <clears throat> minimize the the material body's needs which this body is such a you know a, a network of problems and suffering and focus on the spiritual which is you know the the spiritual is the ocean it's the it's the emblem of happiness peace uh, enlightenment illumination focus on that side by minimizing your material needs so this is just a mental technique to to allow us to manage our body and our and our society and our situation in such a way that we have a lot of time to focus on the positive elements of life the spiritual things in life and uplift ourselves hmm. so you know we often talk about simple living and high thinking so mm -hmm. in a sense they are not necessarily two distinct or parallel things there's also a causal link between the two the thinking yes. is simple then that facilitates high thinking and if the, if the living is complicated then that consumes our thinking and it's not available so much for for higher thoughts yes yeah. yes so and so now when you're talking about the middle way the term middle way is typically buddhist isn't it i don't think that madhyam marga or something like that i don't think there's any sanskrit yes. word which yukta is there and the bhagavata uses the word yukta but there is not there is no mention of it as a way within our tradition isn't it from what i have seen uh, um perhaps there's no um there's no uh, you could say title to it there's no you could say it's not defined as a process in of itself in the way that the madhyamaka you know path is seen it, it is seen as a process in of itself where you try to do everything in moderation um uh, so it's not you know defined as an as a as a practice in its own right but it's definitely there i think in the practice of sadhana it's definitely there in yeah, the of teachings course. of the bhagavad gita it's referred to uh, on many occasions and so it's very you could say very very involved yeah, um an involved practice in in hinduism <clears throat> yeah so now you know going back to the bhagavatam and the problem of evil 
that there's no serious discussion or like uh, no sustained serious discussion directly it's more through narratives so one way i phrase it is that the bhagavatam doesn't so much address the problem the question why do bad things happen to good people it reframes the question that when bad things happen to good people what do good people do mm. and the whole bhagavatam in fact even the ramayana and the mahabharata to some extent there are examples mm. of uh, virtuous responses to adversities mm. that it's not so much why the adversities are coming but how would the virtuous respond to adversities mm. yes uh, thank you for bringing us to this point um uh, this is this is actually the focus of the bhagavatam you know first thing is okay you understand why it's there you know the cause of it uh, think about it but then now that we have what is the solution what is the response what is the resolution to it and i would say that the shrimad bhagavatam's response solution to the problem of evil is devotional heroism devotional heroism to become a hero to take uh, suffering head on and say that i'm ready for even more of it you know as much suffering is there i can handle it why because i want to be a hero but what type of a hero a devotional hero i will overcome i will you know transcend suffering by um by taking shelter of the lord by through through the strength of devotion through the strength of bhakti i will overcome this suffering and this evil and throughout the bhagavatam we find that this is this is the theme this is kind of the mood of the devotees that uh, like the prayers of queen kunti where she says please please you know if needed if this makes me into a better person please let me suffer even more if this means that i can see you face to face if i can have your association my dear lord krishna please uh, let these sufferings come so this is a very powerful method actually of responding to difficult situations in life i was actually reading a book uh, recently on psychology and in that they were talking about um different psychological states that people have when they're in distress and one is panic when they have panic and the book was saying that the way to respond to panic and the way that therapists tell their patients to respond to panic which is an involuntary sort of situation of anxiety within a person's body is to tell their body that i'm not afraid of panic i'm not afraid of i'm not afraid of anxiety and to actually tell their mind give me more anxiety give me more panic because i'm ready to face it mm. and that thought process actually becomes a cure for that situation so rather than being afraid of suffering or even resenting it the devotee sees it as an energy that can be positively utilized for their own progress for their spiritual progress suffering can be utilized for a greater good to benefit themselves and to uh, help others progress on a spiritual path well, that's very interesting from a psychological perspective i was reading a recent book on <clears throat> on cancel culture and uh, the whole idea of creating safe spaces so this author he says that there is a alarmingly increasing prevalence of peanut allergy among people among young people today and this was not something which was maybe there 50 years ago or 100 years ago uh, mm. so then they apparently they did some survey that rather than assuming that our child might have peanut allergy and avoiding exposure right from the mm. beginning if the children are given peanuts right from their as soon as they can start eating then 5 10 years down the line the chances of them having peanut allergy are much lesser wow. so which is quite interesting yes. so the theme of that was sometimes like over protection can be under protection mm. so you're saying that i like the idea of devotional heroism that if we take up suffering as a as a challenge as opportunity then we all can uh, not only face that suffering but we can grow through it we can contribute in the world mm -hmm. and some ways the question why is sometimes uh, maybe the wrong question to ask in the sense that 
we can never get a finite answer a definite answer to it mm. so we can get a reasonable answer exactly. a reasonable answer but not exactly a definite or a precise answer mm. so we yes. could say that the yeah, problem of karma karma or the lord's plan both are reasonable answers but precisely why am i going through this right now mm. in this particular way this is difficult but if we shift you know how can i serve in the situation or how can i act uh, in uh, as you said in the mood devotionally i love that phrase devotional heroism is this something which you have coined or is this you read it somewhere actually actually uh, uh, his grace krishna shetra swami he helped me come up with this uh, phrase devotional heroism so this i uh, i attribute to him um the article which you are referring to it's published in a book that uh, gadi kraman prabhu and krishna shetra maharaj they co-authored and so he uh, you know he was the editor for that book he edited my paper and he suggested that you use this phrase devotional heroism mm. so that's where it's come that that's where it comes from is krishna shetra maharaj that's beautiful yes and and i was going to say that w- what you're saying now it it actually Uh, leads to the third problem of evil which is the phen- phenomenological problem which is just the experience of evil the the actual experience of evil which is very personal which there is not the same for anyone it is it's not uh, the same experience for any two people it's always different and in this we also have you know the discussion on horrendous evils you know evils that are so difficult to make sense of you know like like a child you know dying under a car um or being burnt in a fire and the reason i really like the bhagavatam's response to evil is because the bhagavatam also approaches it with a lot of humility krishna dev is saying ultimately we cannot know the plan of the lord we have to accept it we have to we have to resolve it the problem of evil is never solved it's resolved ultimately it's resolved so, so the difference between solving and resolving i mean you cannot solve the problem because there's no one problem i mean it you can't say okay i'm going to it's something that every individual person has to resolve for themselves they have to it's a personal thing it's 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 a a, a feeling in the heart and so as counselors as devotees as preachers when it comes to the problem of evil we also an individual person's experience of it we also have to take it with a lot of humility like okay i i can help this person uh make sense of it for the greater good which i mentioned is the general response of the bhagavatam help them try to focus more on the bigger picture and focus more on the greater good but at the same time i cannot fully understand their experience i cannot claim to understand the evil that they are experiencing i can also not claim to solve it for them ultimately it's something between them and god and uh i don't know and they don't know why they're going through it but we can just encourage ourselves to rather than turn away from god actually take more shelter in god try to find help through the spiritual channel through through the divine uh, you know mercy of god rather than rejecting that mercy and and that's that's really the key of it that it that there also has to be that humility so if i understand right when you're saying phenomenological it's something like experiential now it's uh, the the, the phenomena itself the experience of it itself like yeah okay for others and for oneself yes yeah so that also means that it's a very personal personalized application of the philosophy because different yes. people will experience the suffering differently they may need to be helped to address it differently also that we cannot just have a, like a one side fits one size fit all formula for people who are in distress and how how to how to guide them or how to help them yes mm-hmm. yes it's very interesting on this very same topic there's there's a, well not there's a book on hindu chaplaincy that has just come up and for that book they wanted me to uh, to contribute an article on the problem of evil why because like you're saying the the philosophical problem is so different from the counts the the problem that the chaplain has 
that how do you make sense of it? And this is the point, one point that I made in that essay is that, you know, the Bhagavatam is the, the chaplain's friend because it's giving a, a response that is very sensitive to the person that, um, that, you know, um, we really can make sense of everything that happens in this world. Um, let's try to help each other. Let's try to find a solution to it. And um, the Bhagavatam isn't claiming to know why it all happens the way it does, other than to say that it happens by the plan of the Lord and that plan is perfect. So it's, um, uh, it's, it's uh, both a, you could say, a philosophical text and it's also a teaching text. It's a pedagogical text. The Bhagavatam teaches and it also um, you know, uh, philosophizes. Mm, side by side. So <clears throat> you said two things. It's very sensitive and it helps us make sense. So when you're saying make sense means not so much in terms of uh, why all this is happening, but make sense more in terms of what can I do about it? How can I move forward? Because at one level, epistemologically, it's very difficult to understand. And the Bhagavatam, as you said, it's, it's, its approach is humble toward that problem. Yes. I mean, in fact, actually, it's due to this problem that the Bhagavatam, uh, that the Bhagavatam uh, is so urgent and relevant. The Bhagavatam itself says this. In the uh, chapter two, Divinity and Divine Service, there's one verse in the Bhagavatam um, uh, in which uh, Srila Prabhupada in his purport, he says, this is the summary of the introduction of the Bhagavatam. And he starts that purport by saying that in this material world, no one can be happy. And therefore the Bhagavatam is now giving the path to happiness. So in academics, we always say that every text has a context. And it's the context that makes the text relevant and makes it worthwhile and important. So the Bhagavatam is our text. It's our main text. What is the context of the Bhagavatam? The context of the Bhagavatam is this very difficult, miserable, material world. And because of that context, the Bhagavatam is all the more relevant because there's a problem. That's why we're looking for the solution. And the solution is there because the problem is there. So the Bhagavatam begins by reflecting on the horror of the, of the Kurukshetra battle. It, it, it starts in some ways with the Mahabharat scene. Draupadi, the Pandavas are there, Ashwatthama. And it's, it starts with you know, trying to make sense of this horrible battle that took place. And what was the purpose of this? How can we, you know, uh, you know what was God's plan in, in this happening? So, the, the context is very important of, of, of any text. And the Bhagavatam's context is the Mahabharata. It's interesting, Srila Prabhupada said that, you know, first you have the Gita, and the Gita is part of the Mahabharata. Then you have the Bhagavatam. Then you have the Chaitanya Charitamrita. And actually, we see that the books actually, in some ways, follow this progression. You have the Gita which in the, and the Mahabharata, and the Bhagavatam starts right there. And it leads us forward. And it says, okay, that all happened. Now, what's the meaning of it? What's the meaning of life? What's the solution to it? How do the great devotees resolve? Um, how do they respond to their situations of suffering? So, when you're saying that we talk about a solution, it is also, like earlier you talked about Kami Sol, it has to be resolved. So solution is more in terms of how these great saintly people who are the exemplars of the tradition how they resolve it and what we can learn from that to resolve our problems in our context. Isn't it like that? Something? Yes. Uh, there's one purport in the Srimad Bhagavatam where Srila Prabhupada says, in the, in the, it's in the first two cantos, Srila Prabhupada says that by reading the Bhagavatam, we can understand every psychological situation in the world. Very interesting quote. He says, by reading the Bhagavatam carefully, we can understand every psychological situation in the world. So what the Bhagavatam does is that it puts great devotees of the Lord in situations that we find ourselves. And while that situation may not be exactly the same, it is quite similar. Like in the case of Dhruva Maharaj, for example, he's in a situation where uh, he, is, uh, he is being discriminated against. 
He's feeling he's in a situation where there's bias and discrimination against him uh, and within his own family. And it, therefore, it's all the more painful. So a person who finds themselves in that same situation can apply that example and say, I'm suffering in the same way Dhruva Maharaj suffered. Now, what is the proper way to handle the situation? The proper way is not to become angry at my brother and try to go and kill him. The, the proper solution is not to, um, to, not to uh, you know, uh, uh, go and become very angry with my father or my stepmother. The solution is try to please the Lord. Hmm. Think big. Let me aspire for something even higher. Uh, let me try to please the Lord so I can become a great person on my own right. Not by pulling my brother down, but by becoming biased myself. Beautiful. And in fact, uh, when he actually attains the Lord, he loses that tendency to get even or get back at them. He becomes yeah. purified of that also. This is an excellent metaphor of say, suffering being like gold being subjected to fire and the impurities yes. coming out. Yeah. You know, it's also struck me when you talk about Dhruva's story, the first thought that had come in my mind was how he was dishonored. But then dishonor is a very generic uh, label to describe that situation. And mm -hmm. bias and discrimination is so much more relatable in our world today. Isn't it? Yes. <clears throat> so yes. it's also a matter of uh, maybe learning to see the Bhagavatam in fresh light so that we can see how it's it it's its situations also relate with and reflect our situations and then we can draw some lessons from there for ourselves yes in fact uh, it, when we go deeper in the story there's a conversation between dhruva's mother and dhruva and after dhruva maharaj is insulted he comes you know he's 5 years old he comes crying to his mother and you know tears are coming down his eyes you know, he's, he's just, his eyes are burning and his heart is burning with anger. And after, after he cries, then his mother and Dhruva start to, to talk. And Dhruva Maharaj, <coughs> uh, uh, his mother hears everything, what, whatever happened. And Dhruva Maharaj's mother tells Dhruva, he says that in fact, what your stepmother has told you is correct. In this situation, the only person who can help you is the Supreme Lord. Why is this? Because your father is the emperor of the entire universe. Who do you have above him to go to, right? And then she says, so go out and seek the Supreme Lord. Go out and find him because he's the only one who can help you. But before you go, she says, give up your envy and your anger for your brother. Why? And then she gives a reason why. She says, um, your father became the king of, of the world because he pleased the Lord. Your, great, your grandfather Swayambhuva Manu became Manu, the father of mankind, because he pleased the Lord. Your great-grandfather Brahma became Brahma because he pleased the Lord. So if you also please the Lord, you will get your desired objective. So she helps him realize that the problem here is not really your brother or your stepmother, but the problem here is that you have not pleased the Lord. So, so what can you do as a person to, to, to solve? The, we don't have control over others, but what control do I have over my own self to solve this problem? See that. And in that way, she encourages him. And therefore, Dhruva Maharaj becomes perfectly successful. So, so it's, it's, uh, it's also giving us such a practical way of dealing with situations of suffering. But okay, I don't have control over the other person. This other person is far too powerful and far too greater than me. But I, there are still solutions. I can, there's, everyone is, is below the Lord. I can please the Lord. And by doing that, become the person that I want to be. It's beautiful. So very, uh, very deep, very instructive. Yeah. So that it gives, I think, examples of, uh, of her father, is Brahmaji and I think Ma, and Manu also, before talking about that. Uh, Suniti gives those examples. So taking this point forward or relating it with the earlier point, which I had made of, you know, don't get too caught in why something is happening in terms of the cause, where it is coming from, but focus on where it is going to take you. That if, if, you, if, you, if this takes you closer to the Lord, if you please him, 
then your problem will be addressed and uh, so now you earlier mentioned the point of the bhagavatam being sensitive there are also times when uh, there is a lot of strong speaking say for example when chitraketu is uh, uh, chitraketu has his son harshashoka pass away and then the sages come to him and they speak strongly even vidura speaks strongly to dhritarashtra as described in the first canto of the shrimad bhagavatam so <clears throat> there are of course different devotees with different moods but some devotees when i try when i try to talk about how karma is is not and i wouldn't say karma is not always the appropriate explanation when somebody is going through suffering so it is definitely not contextually appropriate at certain times and it is also not always adequate to explain everything about suffering i i like your difference between logical and the logical aspect we can explain but the evidence aspect we really can't uh, why so much suffering and it doesn't address the phenomenological aspect at all because that is where devotion or mindfulness or various other approaches are more helpful so one of the when i talk about mm. how karma may not be the appropriate response often that is uh, called as sentimentality i don't know we have to speak the truth mm. and uh, so sometimes mm. telling people that they are suffering because of their own misdeeds is seen as strong speaking which in one sense is fine but i try to say that strong speaking means it doesn't depend on how strongly we speak it is strong speaking has to be judged by how strongly the other person feels inspired to turn toward krishna so mm. so would you like to talk something about that because you brought up the topic of sensitivity over here yes. how how do yes. you talk about the sensitive and mm. other points that i raised over here yeah yes um uh, actually if we go to the uh, narration of parikshit maharaj the bull and the kali then this dynamic which you're such an interesting dynamic which you're bringing up is explicated very nicely when uh, parikshit maharaj and here's the ideal king so he's also in the position of leadership he's he's in the position of a counselor he's the, he's the mediator and he's also the judge so um when king parikshit rolls up to the scene in his golden chariot and he sees dharma with broken legs the first thing that he does is he comes up to dharma and and uh bhumi the cow the bull and the cow and he comes up to them and he says what has happened to you who has done this to you please tell me he consoles them and he asks them for the cause of their suffering and the conversation is a very sweet conversation between them dharma being very exalted doesn't blame kali at all he says i really cannot understand the cause of my suffering i think it's maybe due to my own past misdeeds maybe to due to others maybe to due to the divine plan um and parikshit maharaj hears him and he also agrees with him that actually our suffering is not due to others and there's no you know we, we cannot point really a finger at someone so he he hears him and he agrees with his philosophy and he comforts him does it in a very gentle way and then he turns around in that very conversation station he turns around and he picks up his sword and he looks at kali and he says now i'm going to behead you 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 rascal you you uh, you know person i'm going to cut off your head right after he's just agreed with dharma that actually no one else is the cause of your suffering you can't be sure who is the cause of your suffering he identifies kali as a wrong doer and he's ready there to 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 give him uh, you know punishment so this is the the dynamic that that um there's a there's a place for being firm uh in in issues of justice where the king and every individual has to stand up for for righteousness they have to stand up for equality and for people's rights and there's also a place to be sensitive and the bhagavatam is doing both very nicely the devotee of the lord also does both very nicely they are 
by being strong with Kali, uh, Pariksha Maharaj is transforming his heart because he deserves, uh, he is like that. So he, he needs that, that medicine to wake him up. And to someone who is sensitive, who is uh, you know, in need of that gentleness, Pariksha Maharaj is giving the gentleness. So there's a place for everything. If today Hitler came to us and he was complaining that he was suffering, then we, then, we would tell, then we would tell him the law of karma. We would tell him, sir, you should expect this. You've done very bad. Don't be surprised why you're suffering. And I remember actually conversing with one devotee, very advanced devotee, and he was um, talking to someone else who had similarly you know, been very, very bad in, in their activities. And he told them that, you know, you should write a book on all the bad things that you did. You should write a book because then it will help you recognize, realize the harm that you caused others. And that harm will help you advance. It's not as a way of accusing that person, but telling that person to write a book on all the wrong things that they did, help them realize that, yeah, I actually did do wrong. There's some people like Hitler, they're so wrong that they don't realize that they do wrong. They, they become so insensitive that they actually don't realize that they cause others pain. So, uh, so that is a medicine, you know, people have to also, some people need to be told it's your karma. Really, it's your karma and you deserve it because they need to realize that. Okay. I like this point, you know, that uh, say, okay. it's, that, that's, uh, you know, uh, that's actually a very good, way. I mean, that's a unique situation. I think an extreme situation. No, I appreciate that point. Definitely, Hitler is a very extreme situation as well as the idea of confronting one's uh, problems or confronting one's wrongdoings. But there is in the Christian tradition or the Catholic tradition, at least there's the idea of confession, which has fallen into some bad disrepute because of it being abused, abused at times. But that is also one way of you know, coming face to face with with our worst side or with our dark side. And then mm. that yes. in a sense helps us to both recognize how far we have gone down. And then it also can, if it is done in a positive encouraging context, it also gives us impetus to turn on the right track. And <clears throat> so I agree again. So going back to this point of sensitive, so both places, as you said, you know, being being strong and being gentle it's basically what will be effective at that time so have you found uh, going back to the earlier point karma is have you seen any section in scripture where somebody is suffering and they are told it's you are all you are suffering your own karma directly like mm -hmm. that that, you know, even if, even if you look at the Trashtra yes. or Chitraketu, it's more that you are attached, so you are suffering. So, or you are ignorant, you are an illusion, mm -hmm. so you are suffering. Now, give up your illusion, give up your attachment. So, it's it's more, a, I would say, it's more of a phenomeno phenomenological approach that your suffering is, you are experiencing it so bad because of your attachment or because of your illusions come out of them. So directly mm -hmm. karma is not the thrust. It might be one point, but it, it, I have not seen it as the thrust. Yes. 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 Because the point ultimately of karma is not the reason why Krishna has the cycle of karma is not to get us back. You know, it's, it's really not to uh, punish us, to make it even. The point of karma is to make us learn. Karma gives us what we deserve, but karma also gives us what we need. So what we deserve is also what we need to, to become a better person. So uh, the, the main purpose is to make us into better persons. Because God is not um, revengeful. Uh, you know, the, the laws of nature are not revengeful. It's not, the idea of karma is not revenge, that you did bad and now this is the revenge. The karma is, this is how this person will learn so that they won't do it again. 
And I'll give just a very short story since we haven't done any stories, uh, a, a modern day story of, of a devotee who experienced this in his life. Um, there was one, uh, one you know, European man who joined the temple in a temple in Europe. And you know, he, he became a full-time devotee there. He was very happy. He was serving very nicely. And one of his services was book distribution. He would go out to distribute Srila Prabhupada books. And one time when he was distributing, he went to a very kind of uh, uh, far out place in the, in the countryside. And he was driving down this dirt road. And all of a sudden, out of the bushes, these four thugs came out. And they stopped his car. And so his car stopped. And when the car stopped, then, uh, uh, you know, he, he stopped the car and came out. And, and, and they, he opened the door and they pulled him out of the car and they beat him up very badly and sat in his car and drove off. So they threw him on the side of the road and they drove off with the car and all of his possessions. So then this devotee um, walked back to the temple. You know, it was a long, long walk, uh, but he walked back to the temple and he went back there. And when he reached, he told the devotees what had happened. He told them the story that I was out and these thugs came, they stole the car, they stole my purse, they stole everything, beat me up and sent me, you know, and I'm now back here. And the devotees, when they heard this, they started to, uh, you know, uh, sympathize with him, lament with him. And then he told the devotees, he said, I, it, this is a very painful experience. But he said, I'm very happy that I went through this. He yeah. said, one of the things that I didn't tell you before I joined is that before I became a devotee, I was actually a professional thief. I was actually a thief. Okay. I used to steal things. And then when I joined Krishna consciousness, I became a devotee. I completely gave up that life. I never did that again. And, you know, I promise I never stole anything from anyone here. I, I become completely free from that life. However, he said, ever since I became a devotee, I never realized how much pain I gave people as a thief. You know, I used to steal things, but I used to think, well, this person's rich. And the fact that I'm stealing it from them, it doesn't really give them pain. Or, you know, I stole it, but, you know, they'll get over it. I never realized how much pain I gave people when I used to steal things. And today, by going through this experience, for the first time, I realized just how painful it is to be robbed and to be treated this way. And so, therefore, I'm so grateful for this experience. Because now I know for sure that I'll never do it again. Although I was never doing it, there was still a chance that I could have done it again. But after this experience, I'll never do it again. So that's, that's what karma is about. Karma is there to give us an experience so that we can learn what we need to learn. Because though we have the knowledge, and this person had the knowledge after becoming a devotee, you should not steal, and it's so bad to steal. Until we actually experience certain things, we actually don't learn. And so karma is giving us vigyan. It's actually giving us a realized knowledge that helps us come closer to God. It helps us come on the right path. And karma is not about revenge. Karma is about learning. It's a learning system. That's beautiful. So that means primarily if, if someone learns, then maybe they may not have to go through that much suffering. And if somebody doesn't learn, they may have to go through more suffering also. So in that sense, it's not so much mm. the idea of karma is actually quite empowering. It is. It is not because it, it places the, especially I think if we, if we combine karma with uh, the idea of a loving God who has a plan for our life, then it can become very, very empowering. I'm going through this, but uh, there's something for me to learn and grow. And uh, mm. I just need to do my, I just need to do my best in the situation. And uh, okay, couple of uh, do you want to respond to what I said? Or I have a couple of other points to discuss. Hmm? Uh, sure, let's do the other point. Yes, okay. this, I, I mean, uh, yeah, one thing I'll just say is that is that, uh, yes, that's exactly the thing that karma, the positive side is that we are in control of our future. It actually is very empowering uh, because um, we're learning what we need to learn, but we also have control. We are the makers of our destiny. Like Dhruva, for him, it was freedom because now he realized 
that I am actually, my father is not in control of my destiny. I am in control of my destiny. So it's very positive also. Yes. Yeah, that's true. You know, I, I'm, I'm hoping to write many books. Maybe sometimes they'll come up. But about destiny, I say one thing that we are, we are not the masters of our destiny, but we are the makers of our destiny. Masters in the sense that it's not that we don't control when what will happen to us or when our actions will produce the results. But still, the actions that we are going to do now, they are going to shape our future, not just shape, but they're going to make our future. So <clears throat> in that sense, it's a very, uh, it's not just a spiritually, spiritually uplifting message, but it's also emotionally, a psychologically energizing message. Yes. So, so now, uh, yes. would you like to firstly, we, we can conclude with this. Uh, I would like to talk you to talk about something about your upcoming book also, because that book is on this whole topic. Mm. So uh, how, are you going through, is it like a comparative analysis of the Bhagavatam with other solutions to the problem of evil? Or are you going over various, various ways in which through the various narratives the Bhagavatam is addressing? Or how, how are you doing this book? So actually, um, the, my upcoming book, it's being published by Oxford University Press. And it's on the discussion of Maya that we find in um, the, the, the tradition of Sanskrit literature, particularly the Srimad Bhagavatam. And uh, in the discussion of Maya, a very important discussion is the problem of suffering. That's in some ways how this topic is relevant to us in terms of our day-to-day -day lives and also uh, the general academic discourse. But the, the, the book um, more, more generally deals with many of these questions we discussed today, which is uh, what is real and what is unreal? Is the world real? Is it unreal? Uh, what is Maya? Many people have said that Maya is unreal or Maya is simply a state of mind. It's simply illusion. But uh, by carefully analyzing every, uh, going through every reference of Maya in the Sriman Bhagavatam, which is over you know, 600 times you find it being mentioned there, uh, we find that actually Maya has three very important roles in our theology. One is Maya forms the world. At its very basis, Maya is creative energy. It is the energy of God which mm -hmm. forms this world. And it's that Shakti or that power that transforms into this world. And in this part, I discuss how, I discuss metaphysics, how even in Western philosophy, energy or power is seen as the fundamental um, metaphysical elements of this universe. After we look at that, that Maya as a creative energy, the second part I look at, well, how does that creative energy affect us? And that is Maya as a human condition. Maya affects us by making a world that is elusive. I don't like the word illusion because the English word illusion has so many different meanings. So here the problem is not in how to translate the Sanskrit word Maya, but generally I find the problem is in translating the English word illusion. What do we mean by illusion? It's, very, uh, it's a very a bit too ambiguous of a term. So Maya is real. Maya is the creative power of God, but it is elusive. It puts us into uh, a mistaken conception of life. Uh, we get we misidentify things. So uh, the way Maya affects us is it makes the human condition. The most common metaphor in the Bhagavatam for the human condition is the dream condition, as we discussed today. Hmm. The word swapna and its relation to the human condition is mentioned over sixty times in the Bhagavatam. 60 times the Bhagavatam says this life is like a dream. So it is in the context of the human condition that I, I discuss that why is it that God puts us into this horrible dream? You know, why are we in this dream world? Why do we have to experience this bad dream at night? Why not a good dream? Uh, and, uh, and so in that context, Maya um, discusses and is deeply in intertwined with the problem of suffering and the human condition. 
And the third way that Maya is used, which is possibly the most important way in the Bhagavatam, is Maya is, is seen as divine mother. And this is the point that, although present in Vedanta philosophy, Vedantins miss many times, that ultimately Maya is a positive energy. It is a creative energy. It creates the human condition to help us learn things, but ultimately it's a loving mother. It's, it's creating this human condition and this world to help us come back to the spiritual world, come back to God. Maya is there to teach us like a loving mother teaches us, sometimes through the school of hard knocks, but it's meant to teach us to come back to the world, to come back to God. The world is imperfect, but the world is perfect for its purpose, and therefore it's perfect. The prison house is imperfect, but it's perfect for its purpose. An ideal prison house will, will make a person perfect by the time they leave, and they will leave at a certain time. So this material world is perfect for its purpose because Maya, which is this world, is the divine mother. And this is a concept we find in, in Sankhya also, that Sankhya sees Prakriti as the divine mother. And Prakriti and Maya in the Bhagavatam are identified. Therefore, Bhagavatam is a Vedanta text and also a Sankhya text. And in the context of being a divine mother, God is also the, uh, Maya is also the personal energy of God as Yoga Maya. And as the personal energy of God, she is Krishna's sister, Subhadra. Right? This is another name of Subhadra, Yoga Maya, where she is actually um, arranging the many, many um, uh, pastimes of, the, uh, of God by, by her magical powers. Because Maya is very elusive, but elusive can also be a good thing. Right? In love, magic is so wonderful. So she creates so this many wonderful is, arrangements. So for the this one made. So are you using Maya in the term, yes. the sense it was used Yoga Maya in the Bhakti tradition, or because the third sense is somewhat similar to Yoga Maya, not exactly the same, but it seems to have some pointers toward that, some similarities with that. So this is, yeah, this is one point to note in the Bhagavatam that. Um, that Bhagavatam and from what I've seen, other uh, Vaishnav literatures, other Puranas, uh, Bhagavad Gita, of uh, the Mahabharat, that Maya is just one. Maya is the creative power of God. The energy is just one. Then the Bhakti traditions, the actual schools of Bhakti, like Gaudiya Vaishnavism, they systemize it and they say, okay, there's Yoga Maya. That's in terms of the divine, uh, you know, uh, Leelas of the Lord, there's Mahamaya in terms of the mature life. But a point that Srila Prabhupada also makes in the 10th canto, uh, in his introduction to the 10th canto, he says, Maya is one. Yes. The energy of God is just one, the energy of God, which is Maya. When it manifests itself in this world, then it is, we call it, we have now labeled it Mahamaya. That is then Maya as Mahamaya, but it's still the same Maya. And when that Maya is seen in relation to God, it is Yoga Maya. Uh, and, and it is serving the pastimes of the Lord and bringing the devotees closer to, to the Lord. Mm. But yoga maya is the same as mahamaya, is, which is the same as maya. All maya comes from yoga. All maya comes from the energy of the Lord. It's yeah. the Lord's energy. So yoga maya and maya are actually the same thing. We use them more systematically, but you'll see how in the Bhagavatam and also in the Gita, Yoga Maya is also used in the context of Maya in the material world. There's yeah, many, many that's instances. True. That's true. So in, in one sense, that each tradition, if we consider scripture to be like a territory, each tradition offers us a map for navigating the territory. And say, Yoga Maya and Mahamaya, this differentiation, is like a taxonomical analysis for helping us understand things better. But Prabhupada, as you said, also says that Maya is one, like electricity can be used for heating or for cooling. So similarly, that illusory energy can take us closer toward the Lord or away from the Lord. And uh, yes. so, In yeah. Go, so just going back to your three points when you mentioned as a creative energy, as the, as the energy that produces an effect, 
our shapes are perfection the human condition uh, they, that shapes are condition or shapes are human condition and then lastly as a as a divine mother so <clears throat> now <coughs> so when we talk about the problem of evil or the problem of suffering at one level if <clears throat> our entanglement with illusion decreases then we could say the at the second level how much we are enmeshed in something that in a particular in the particular dualities of the world how much we are enmeshed in that that will decrease and then mm. the suffering will also decrease so it's like somebody is watching a horror movie and is completely into that horror movie they will feel far more horrified than somebody just casually glancing at it without getting involved so mm. in a sense yes a uh, detachment mm. detachment is also one way of uh, decreasing our suffering and thereby decreasing the the magnitude of the problem of evil so mm-hmm. if if the if the influence of the illusory energy on us decreases then yes. we will also suffer less in that even if we are going through the same physical experience our suffering may be lesser yes yes yeah and that's why knowledge is emphasized it's not definitely the goal or the end but knowledge is emphasized in the bhagavatam because by having spiritual knowledge we can we can um detach ourselves from that situation uh in, in psychology this is called detached contact so we're in contact but we're detached contact and and then that same situation that same exchange is less painful so mm. so therefore um we must um uh take you know take knowledge seriously this is why the knowledge of the bhagavatam is there because it is through that knowledge that we're able to <coughs> um rise above the situation just like a person who's dreaming um they may not be able to get out of the dream but if in the dream they realize that actually this is a dream and these things won't stick to me you know i'm actually not being chased by a tiger and very soon this dream will end then that by itself will will make them so happy and of course the ultimate solution is that they wake up from the dream uh, the ultimate solution is not pro- solving their problems that they're facing in the dream but is waking up waking them up from the dream but in the meantime until they wake up it will help them solve their problems by by just understanding that they're not so important and they're not so close to and they're not so entangled in it that's amazing and uh, so so your book is uh, by explaining the concept of maya through that angle you are addressing the problem of evil in a somewhat you could say a more of a lateral way than a direct way yes because one thing about evil uh and you brought up a very nice point thank you for reminding me that, that the problem of evil is a world view like what i find you cannot solve the problem of evil in isolation okay this is the question this is the answer to actually respond to evil you have to see that response in a certain world view and so it actually worked out very well because when i started writing my book on maya i wasn't thinking actually no i was always interested in the problem of evil but i didn't really see the relationship between the two so deeply but in the context of writing it it actually fit very well because we really cannot understand the bhagavatam's response to evil without understanding its world view what's the bigger picture you know what is you know god what is creation who are we you know how long are we here in this material world and so it's really presenting the world view of the bhagavata and it's arguing um in response to the common you could say um common obsession of academics with impersonalism it's trying to 
vouch for personalism. That, you know, the worldview of the Bhagavata is a personalist viewpoint. Um, mm. it, it is clearly the case, you know, if, if we read the Bhagavatam as a whole, rather than selecting specific verses, when we see the text as a whole, it is clearly a personalist text. And um, there's a strong voice of personalism here. Uh, this is, you know, um, Hindu personalism. It, and in, 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 in contrast with the impersonalism, and Maya is actually a real thing. This world is real. It's creative power. Yes, it's elusive, but it's not illusion in the way that Shankaracharya described it. It's not unreal in the way that Shankaracharya described it. In fact, even in the Upanishads, in the Vedic texts, Maya is never unreal or completely elusive or completely an illusion. Shankara's concept that Maya and the world is unreal is his own unique mm. contribution to the history of Indian thought. He, he deserves to be recognized as, as an original thinker. He's not uh, summarizing the ideas of the Upanishads. In fact, in the Upanishads, you don't find um, Maya mentioned so often. There's, there's four or five instances of the word Maya in all of the Upanishads. And three of them appear in the Shvetashara Upanishad. And they're in relation to Rudra, where this world is called the uh, Maya, and Rudra, Lord Shiva, is the Mayan. And through his Maya, through his creative power, he creates the world. So, so you have Maya and the Mayan. Again, used in very personalist terms, that Maya is the power of the Mayan, which is Rudra, in the same way that the Bhagavatam is using it. So just historically, in terms of textual analysis, if we look at the text, Maya by far is used as creative power. Yeah, there's one or two instances where it's used in the sense of to measure or in the sense of, you know, um, illusion. It's definitely elusive. It's magical. It's like the Maya of Indra is very magical. But it's, it's just not used in the way that Shankaracharya uses it. So Shankaracharya's use of the term Maya is his own contribution. It's, it's his own uh, interpretation. Hmm. Yeah, I've read this in several places. So that's another thing. Yeah, because I've read this point in several places that even when I was uh, reading the Vedanta Sutra, even I think several prominent uh, Western scholars who commented on the Vedanta Sutra, they do say that Ramanuja's explanation of Vedanta Sutra uh, is a more, more natural explanation and whereas Shankara seems to be using the Vedanta Sutra to, to speak his own philosophy. So of course, Baldev Vidyabhushans is not that prominent till now in the mainstream uh, a mainstream academia. So now you talk about illusion and illusive. So Prabhupada also uses the word illusory. So how do you illusive means that which causes illusion or means how do you, how do you differentiate between these three terms in terms of the utility? Yes. Yes. My understanding is that Srila Prabhupada is using the word illusion or illusory in the sense of misidentification. Yes, of course. So, so, so when, I, when I see a, a rope as a snake, the example that you said, uh, my understanding is, um, or you could say that understanding is an illusion because I misidentified something as another thing. Now, when Shankaracharya and other philosophers oftentimes use the word illusion, they're using it in the sense of unreality. It is an illusion in the sense that it really doesn't exist. Um, and, um, and, and so because there's this, uh, you could say, the ambiguity of the term, I was starting to find it confusing to use that term. Bhagavatam also uses, or you could say, Srila Prabhupada uses the word illusion in the Bhagavatam to suggest unreality. In fact, in some translations, like the famous verse um, uh, which describes Maya, in the Chatur Shloki Bhagavatam, um, uh, Prabhupada says how the world is unreal. And, and there they're using the word unreal and illusion in the sense of temporality. Because then after that, he explains that it's unreal in the sense that it's temporary. It's a lesser reality. Mm. So, um, so therefore, uh, therefore, the word is used uh, in very specific senses. Uh, and here I'm using it in the sense of something that is, um, is misleading, 
the world can be misleading and therefore it's elusive. It's, uh, it, it, it bewilders a person. Okay, makes sense. By the way, go, uh, going back to a fundamental question, is evil itself a category in the dharmic traditions? Because we have the concept of Maya and we have the concept of say Papa or we have Anarthas. But um, when we talk about evil, uh, is the, I don't even know whether there's a precise Sanskrit term which equates with the word evil. And uh, then we can go into moral evil and natural evil. And then we can have uh, like say something like natural evil can be called as klesha or moral evil can be called as uh, uh, something like uh, contaminations within, impurities within. Uh, yes, absolutely. So, so that's the point that that's also where Maya is very relevant because there is no term for evil. Right? There's suffering, which is Dukkha, Papa, all these different terms are there. Uh, pa papa, it can also mean uh, sin, but it can also mean misfortune. Um, but even if it is sin, it's like, it's like being bad, like a child is bad, doing a bad act. Papa does not mean like evil in the sense of Satan. So the, the only thing that is, you could say, alluded to as a negative thing, you could say, the world of illusion, uh, the elusive world is Maya. Right? People say this in, in general language. They say, oh, you are in Maya. You are, you are you know, uh, you know, like this. Or Maya is often seen as, as something that is bad in this world. So, so then what is Maya? Maya is the uh, misconception, living, not seeing things as they are, but seeing things in the way that they are not. And that is the fundamental human problem. In, in the Vedic texts. So, so, so therefore to talk about the problem of evil in the context of Bhagavatam, you have to talk about Maya because that's the problem. That is what is, that is the, you could say the Eastern equivalent discussion of evil. And on this point, I should mention that every tradition in the world has what they say, what matters most to them, a, a matter of primary concern. So, in Christianity, the matter of primary concern is sin. So, okay, what is sin? Um, uh, uh, and sin is bad. And so Christianity is a solution to sin. Um, in um, um, uh, in uh, another tradition, uh, it's just escaping my mind. Uh, yeah, in, in Confucianism and Taoism, the Chinese traditions, their primary concern is disharmony. The, the human problem is disharmony. And therefore the solution is harmony. That um, religion means something that harmonizes everything. In the Vedic texts, the primary concern, what matters to them most is ignorance. Is if we, if we are to use that word illusion, the misconception, bewilderment, that is the cause of our problems in this world and suffering. Therefore, the fundamental human problem is Maya. And therefore, Bhakti and the Bhagavata are seen as solutions to that fundamental human problem. Other problems like disharmony, sin, all these things are, are they believe, coming from this fundamental problem, which is ignorance. And therefore, the solution uh, is, is, is this. Hmm. So this is what matters most to them. And that's what the Bhagavatam solution is. To. That's, you know, one of the most common phrases from the Upanishads that even we also call Tamasoma Jyotir Gama. So that is Tamaso darkness or ignorance. That's so true. And when we talk about it from this perspective, in the Bhagavad Gita ends with Nashto Moha Suti Labda or Kachi Dagyana Sammoha Pranashtasti Dhananjaya. That's the primary concern. That is your illusion dispelled. Mm, yes. And Krishna says in the Gita, in the Chatur Shloki, he says, Tesham evanu kam partham, aham agyana nashim, nashim atma bhavas to jnana deepena bhashvata. The way I, I guide people is I give them knowledge from within their heart. That's true. So, so although our focus is on bhakti, but still the human condition, bhakti is, is, the, is the solution to the human condition. The human condition is one described of ignorance. Mm. 
of avidya, not of sin, like in the Christian tradition, but of ignorance. We are in a state of ignorance. Interesting that, are, that so there is, we could say that the extreme, some people say that the idea of sin itself is introduced in the Indian tradition or it's imposed on the Indian tradition, it's a Western category. Rather than saying that it is, it is present, uh, I think even Papa is not an ex- accurate translation of sin because yes. uh, so sin has certain connotations which Papa does not have. Not or Papa also has some connotations which sin, sin does not include. But still, it is, I think it may be more precise to say that that's not a primary concern. So yes. then even in that sense, that's why guilt is also not primary. It's not, a, it's not considered a primary pathological problem also. Because often in the Catholic tradition, the idea of sin is associated with the idea of guilt. Mm. And then... Yes. 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 Yeah. We have the idea of big karma. So we have the idea of doing bad acts. So you can be a bad person, do bad acts, big karma, um, as opposed to uh, you know karma or sakarma uh, or um, su karma. But uh, the the idea is that there are bad acts, but it's still not exactly. Um, uh, it does not have all the connotations of sin as in the Western traditions. Hmm. True. So do you see at a bigger level, maybe this could be a concluding question, that do you see that uh, the Bhagavatam's response to the problem of evil, is it already having a significant impact or do you see it, foresee it having a significant impact in the mainstream intellectual discourse? Mm-hmm. Because at a, in generally when we as an institution, mm-hmm. we focus more on reaching out to people at an individual level. Right. And many people do find uh, the, pro- the explanation of karma mm. relevant, appealing. What I find is that it's very helpful, but not when a person is going through suffering, mm. especially not when they're going through extreme suffering. In yes. general, if they have come for a talk, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, but it's, it's, so it has its value and it has its utility. But the overall wisdom of the Bhagavatam or of the Bhakti tradition in general, how do you see its, uh, a, its contribution to the mainstream intellectual discourse today or in the near future? <clears throat> Every tradition has its strengths, uh, philosophically speaking, and also you could say theologically speaking and in terms of practice. Every tradition has their strengths. And... I personally feel in terms of its response to, problem, to the problem of suffering in this world, mm. the Srimad Bhagavatam and you could say Vedic literature in general has a strength here. It has something very tangible to offer because, because of the whole package, like you're saying, reincarnation, karma, but not just karma, the plan of God, like you can actually, at least in some way or the other, you can make sense of it. And so many of my students at the university have, have by themselves, have mentioned this point, how in the Eastern tradition, they do find a more satisfying response to suffering and evil in, in this world. How to understand it and also how to deal with it, how to make sense of it. So it is one of our strengths. And I think that's why it's, it's a good topic. It's a good contribution for the world. And when presented in its wholeness, like you're saying, not just karma, but in its wholeness, um, then uh, people will, will really appreciate it. People are appreciating it and people will re- really appreciate it because of the lack of that response in other traditions. And I'll just give you one small example. Uh, Charles Darwin is very famous as the, you could say, the uh, founder of the evolutionary theory. And many people think that the reason why Charles Darwin became an atheist was because of his evolutionary theory. But actually, Charles Darwin did not become an atheist due to that reason. He became an atheist uh, because he could never find a satisfying response to the problem of suffering. Darwin grew up in a nice Christian family, in a Christian uh, home in, uh, in England. Uh, he, he grew, his parents were Christian, his wife was Christian, and um, he was very well versed in the Bible. <clears throat> 
And at a certain point in his life, his young daughter, who was like four or five years old, she died due to some disease, contracting some disease, she mm-hmm. died. And Darwin could never make sense of why he writes in his biography, why an all loving and kind God would allow this, an innocent person like his daughter to die in this way. He just could not make sense of it. Furthermore, Darwin himself had a lot of health problems. He had intense pain in his stomach. So he couldn't understand why God had given him a body that had so much pain. There's actually one small uh, uh, side point on this. David Hume, a very famous Western philosopher, he mentioned, he said, just take your little toe. You know, think about your little toe. How much pleasure can your toe give you? Well, maybe you could you know, massage it with some oil or make it hot or these things. And then he says, how much pain can that toe give? So much pain, right? If we get it under a, uh, under a truck or something, it can give so much pain. So it seems like the body is meant to give us more pain than there is more pleasure. So Darwin also observed this. He said, why would God give me a body where there's so much pain? But in his own Christian tradition, he could not find a satisfying response with the resources that he had. Of course, times have changed since that time. And furthermore, what he believed to be the greatest evil was eternal damnation. He could not understand why a loving God would send people to hell for eternity. And that completely didn't make sense to him. And so then as a result, he started to you know, go on his voyages and do research. And then he found that in, in nature, there was so much pain and suffering. He came up with this idea that actually there is no ultimate you know, purpose or goodness in this world. This world is simply a blind um, a struggle for existence. It's a struggle for existence where the fittest survive. So even someone like Charles Darwin, famous people, they, they, could, they didn't find satisfying responses to the problem of evil. And so I think the Vedic tradition has a very a wonderful contribution to make in this regard. Mm. Yeah, this is very important. Now, I also like that your earlier point that explanations have to, you cannot answer specific questions without addressing fundamental worldview questions. So while evolution to some extent can explain the lived reality of the world, that there is so much suffering, but it, it, it doesn't really provide anything to make life meaningful. Mm. So it is, it is in a sense, it is, it is a very cold way of looking at the world. Mm. And uh, you know, Richard Dawkins is uh, like a much more extremist inheritor of Dar- Darwin. So there is a striking, uh, he, this, he also uses the problem of evil to, to, to you could say, uh, to beat a beat, a, beat theists. But then uh, when I uh, read his writings, to much of what he's speaking doesn't really apply to the dharmic tradition. Or rather, we could say his critiques are often quite specific to the Abrahamic religions and his problem of evil, he doesn't even seem to be aware that there are any other explanations. And if you take it further, actually, uh, Darwin himself was not, uh, certainly not an anti-theist. He was, whether he was atheist was also open to question, is more of agnostic. He did talk about, you know, maybe the, the creator breathed life into the first life forms or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, but if we take the Darwinian worldview as an absolute explanation for the world, then it, then it doesn't allow atheists to, to use the problem of evil. Because within the reductionistic worldview, there is no such thing as good or evil. Simply nature is existing and we are products of nature. And all our experiences are nothing but uh, neurochemicals firing in the, inside the brain, brain cells, electrochemical, mm-hmm. electrochemical signals firing in the brain cells. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, it, it's uh, that worldview. If, so if we, I'm, I'm mentioning this, if we compare the atheistic worldview, we compare the Christian worldview, or broadly the Abrahamic worldview, there is a significantly stronger 
uh, explanatory potential within the Bhagavatam's worldview that has not yet been tapped and brought into the mainstream discourse. And there is a lot of opening for that. Absolutely. Yes. I, I, I could not agree more. Um, uh, there are so many people who are, who are, um, you could say, who are wanting to, to have, so, so to, to have a worldview that is satisfying to the heart. In other words, um, uh, one thing that I realized very quickly in my studies is that that our choices in this world are not to uh, choose between between something that is proven or not proven, right? There's no, you know, no one can prove. Uh, you could say in in abs in objective terms or absolute terms that the worldview of the Bhagavatam is correct as opposed to the worldview of uh, some other tradition or some other place, right? But what we do is that we choose the worldview that is most appealing amongst the worldviews that we have, that makes the most sense amongst the worldviews that we have, right? That's what we do. There's no way to put it in a test tube and say, well, this one's right and this one's wrong. We choose the one that, that is more satisfying and logical and makes the most sense to us. So like you mentioned about evolutionary theory, it does answer the questions about why there's, you know, it, it does um, apply to questions about meaningless suffering in this world, the struggle for the existence, but then it doesn't make sense in terms of why do we look for purpose or meaning in this world? Right? It doesn't answer the question, why would someone look for purpose and meaning when they're simply meant to survive in the forest. Surviving in the forest does not mean that you will want to know why the forest came. But we as human beings are not just trying to survive in the forest, but we're also trying to figure out why is the forest there and how can I play music in the forest. Uh, but the Bhagavatam is then answering both. So it's, it's a more satisfying world viewpoint than the evolutionary. The evolutionary could be right, but it's more satisfying because it's saying, this is why there's a struggle for existence. We've answered that question. But this is also why we search for meaning and purpose in the world, because we're also spiritual beings that who want to search for meaning and purpose. Why is it that we have the fear of death? Why is it that we want to be eternal? Why is it that we aspire for a place that's higher than us? If we are matter, it's natural for matter to die. Why do we aspire for eternality? It's because we are spiritual beings. So the Bhagavatam is not giving the only worldview or the, um, the only possible worldview or the, right, the only right worldview, but I see it as giving the most complete worldview, the one that satisfies us the most. And uh, there's a verse in the Bhagavatam which says this, I forget the Sanskrit, but it says that there's, uh, the Bhagavatam sees truth everywhere. It sees threads of truth present in all books, so many different books. But what the Bhagavatam offers is the most complete form of truth, the most comprehensive form of truth. So you take all those threads together, you tie them together, that's the Bhagavatam. And, um, and you actually also see it just from an academic point of view, how it combines so many different philosophies, it brings it together. It, 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 it actually responds or it includes them and then it pre presents the nigama kalpataro or galitam phalam, the ripened fruit of all those different knowledges. So, that's so yeah, beautiful. That is the. Uh, yeah, okay. that's beautifully put. That that means rather than looking at uh, simply the logical aspect or the argumentative aspect, we look at the holistic way, and it's we can we focus on it being most complete. It's a beautiful note to maybe. Conclude. Usually, I try to summarize at the end of a podcast. I mean, we went over many different subjects, but I'll try, and then you can add some concluding words if you like. I think we discussed on broadly: Does karma answer the address the problem of evil? And then within that, we started by discussing about how karma has a logical aspect that appeals, but it is not so much uh, suited when people are actually going through suffering. And then you brought in. 
the there are different problems of evil so the logical the logical problem of evil that can be addressed reasonably well by karma uh, we discussed the free will defense and that explains why suffering exists but it doesn't really explain why why i am suffering but, but if you bring in free will defense along with karma and reincarnation then it becomes much uh, much uh, more coherent mm -hmm. and then then we can go back to the causal chain and where it starts so where did karma begin so we discussed about how karma is cons uh, that the, the the idea of beginninglessness that's what we discussed and very very good point you made that uh, what is beginningless is is we have free will our existence is beginningless our free will is beginningless but suffering is not beginningless because it is in that there is a two categories that which is that is which is eternal that which is temporary and suffering there is repeated declaration in scripture that it can end so if it can end that means it doesn't belong to the eternal category it belongs to temporary category therefore it will it if it is ending then it also needs to have a beginning yes. and then uh, we also have went to a little bit uh, side uh, uh, side discussion on further about the mode of presentation of the bhagavatam that how the bhagavatam doesn't really in our scriptures they don't address <coughs> the problem of evil so much directly because it's presumed that the world is a place of distress and it's and the solution is we discuss it later that it's it's coming out of avidya so because of that there's not that much of a focus then discuss two three conversations especially the druva the druva conversation to address how bias and discrimination is dealt with not so much by getting back at those who are discriminating against us but by pleasing the lord then bishma's past time as well as bishma instruct you this as well as the dharma and the parichit conversation so we discuss also the evidential problem of evil that's where where karma doesn't may not seem adequate because why is so much suffering so the idea is there's a plan of the lord and then if we become there's bhagavatam of the call for devotional heroism by which we can all uh, take up the suffering and grow through that suffering and uh, the bhagavatam gives many examples of if you quoted prabhupad saying that every psychological situation can be understood from the bhagavatam that is is striking and then when you talk about phenomenological phenomenological so there also we discuss a little bit about mindfulness and the buddhist approach okay. the middle way so by decreasing our entanglement in illusion we can actually uh, we can suffering will be experienced less okay. and in that sense that's also a uh, that's also a wave in which we can help so logical is at one level for education but for uh, for helping people at a level of grief the other two approaches are also there in that sense the bhagavatam offers the multi pronged approach they also talk about how chaplaincy the bhagavati is a book which is not just uh, it's a pedagogical pedagogy pedagog uh, it's a book of pedagogy 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 and it's also a book of you could say pastoring or counseling mm. and then <clears throat> toward the end you mentioned yes. about maya your book and maya i like the idea of three things maya as a uh, creative energy maya as the illusion created within us and the maya as the divine mother so <clears throat> and the bhagavatam's world view has a lot of potential to not necessarily to be proven right but to to be seen as the most fulfilling world view mm. or the most uh, most complete world view so if we contrast the uh, the christian world view it focuses a lot on sin and it really can't address because of the lack of various factors the predest pre the pre, pre existence reincarnation you mentioned how the charles darwin also that idea of eternal damnation it mm. also makes the what was the Um, greater good suffer greater good ex argument also it makes it yes it makes it incoherent so and then if we consider the reductionistic world view from materialism or evolution 
then that is not at all it doesn't tell us why we should have a purpose why we long to have a purpose mm. and how we can find a purpose also mm. so so the mm. bhagavatam's world view is very empowering in that sense and uh, thank you for this discussion you want to add any concluding words you actually summarized it very well prabhu uh, i i also just wanted to say that through this conversation i myself um, you know learned so much i i started to realize that how much of a um of a you could say a rigorous philosophical discourse this discussion is in in the shrimad bhagavatam looking through it by the logical problem evidential problem and phenomenological problem of evil that actually in the uh, in the area of western philosophy there's there's so much to contribute here that the bhagavatam has and um and uh and the way that i primarily looked at it before was through the narratives through the teachings so so not only does it um offer you know the response to evil through its um through its its narrations but also there's you know through this conversation what becomes so evident is that there's also such a vibrant philosophical discussion that is present here and um and and you know your questions and your comments really brought that out that we you know there's there's a something that we truly have to contribute to this discourse Yes, and Thank I really you. enjoyed my time with you. Thank you very much. Thank you for sparing your time. It was wonderful having you, and hopefully we will have some future discussions again sometime. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, and I myself am a fan of your podcasts, so I become a fan of your podcasts. And uh, today, actually, this is kind of off off call, but um, today we discussed so many things, and our you know our discussion went in so many ways. So please feel free to. you know uh take whatever you need so we don't have to you know co- cover the whole thing uh because it's a very broad topic with so many different avenues and directions and we can go in so many different ways so please feel free to just take whatever you need from that conversation i think everything was relevant although it might not be focused and one of the attractions of this format is the spontaneity of the discussion also it's yes. not so much like a uh it's not a discourse it's a discussion so i think everything is important over here thank you very much once again wonderful thank you prabhu hari krishna hari krishna